afternoon and thank you for joining us for this afternoon kickoff of Design Day at this wonderful and unusual online ASLA conference. My name is Gina Ford. I'm a principal and co-founder of a firm called Agency Landscape and Planning. And I'm here today to facilitate a conversation I hope you'll enjoy called The Exquisite Detail, How Big Ideas Get Expressed in Tangible Craft. Perhaps you're here because you live to detail Perhaps you're here because you really struggle with it. I'm here because I'm inspired to think about how big ideas of places and the design work we do gets translated and made more beautiful and more rich through the idea of craft. In order to have this conversation, I really was excited to reach out to two of my favorite designers, David Fletcher from San Francisco, California. He runs uh, and founded Fletcher Studio and Maura Rockcastle, she co-founded 10 by 10 Studio in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And though, as you can see, we are geographically diverse, we share a love of making places. And I look often to the work that David and Maura do um, across the country um, because I love the way they think about the tectonics of making and the spirit of place that gets made um, as we think about detailed design. So here's how this is going to play out in this brief time we have with you today. We're going to have three quick conversations. The first, part one, will be the big idea. How do you think about a project? What is the big idea that really drives uh, design? And then we'll pause for discussion. Secondly, part two, we'll talk about defining the palette. How do you move from a big idea into defining a material palette that really speaks to the specificity of place? And that gives you a really remarkable way of thinking that leads into part three, the exquisite detail. In part three, we'll talk about how we land the idea of palette and big idea into craft, into really specific ideas about place and materiality and quality, and how that all lands in one physical thing or experience. After each of these parts, we'll have a brief discussion, and I hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, we'll jump into part one, the big idea. How do we start to understand and read a site? And then what do we describe are the big ideas for the site's change? Hi, I'm David Fletcher with Fletcher Studio Landscape Architecture and Urban Design. And I'm excited to join Gina and Mara today to talk about South Park and to talk about the exquisite detail. It was a huge honor to be chosen to design and rethink San Francisco's oldest space. We worked with San Francisco Rec Parks, the community, and the South Park Improvement Association over the period of what seemed forever, but it was like three or four years, to design and plan and fundraise for the park's transformation. South Park is the oldest public space in San Francisco, and it was built in 1852 by a developer named George Gordon, who had a vision of bringing English style parks to San Francisco and build housing around it. In these images, you can see from about 1853 up to 1950, some of its transformations, an early strolling garden with a windmill and a well pumping water for the emerging neighborhood. You can see disaster relief housing um, after the 1906 earthquake. Many different communities lived there, Filipino communities, Jewish communities, African-American communities, longshoremen, and uh, have used and loved the park for over 150 years. The park itself in the 90s and thousands was in disrepair and also trees had basically grown up around the, the perimeter blocking light. The other thing about it was its circulation was convoluted. A lot of the program for the park was in the middle, kind of crammed in the center of it. You had a small plaza, which you're seeing a top lot and an older kids play area. And then also with the trees growing around the perimeter, created a concave condition throughout the park that focused water so it'd get really muddy for many parts of the year. So we knew that solving the programmatic issue, the circulation and the water would be the biggest challenge. In our design, what we did was we took those programs and then spread them throughout the park, focusing on the east and west side as being plazas, a central plaza, creating what you're seeing here, which is a main meadow, basically two green areas connected with a diagonal path to create an inclined lawn in one of the areas and um, also a play area. How we dealt with water was a really critical part of the park, whether it's crowning the park so that water goes to the perimeter now, 
but also creating rain gardens that can help to recharge and store water and creating a drainage system that basically is percolation system and not tied to the city. The resulting park is a sinuous kind of elongated programmatic pathway that moves its way through and around green areas, starting with on the left, a kind of a gray garden, a play area, again, an inclined gigantic green chaise lounge is what we're calling it. And then the meadows, which are combined and an activation of the perimeter. So it was really critical that you could go to the perimeter and not necessarily have to go within the park. Here you can see an image looking the west, closest to us, east farthest, and then the pathway system moving through the park. Hi, my name is Maura Rockcastle. I'm principal and co-founder of 10 by 10, or landscape architecture and urbanism practice here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm so excited to be here with Gina and David today uh, to talk about the exquisite detail. So I'm gonna take us over to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we are gonna start driving along this quarter mile long, 110 feet wide Mill 19, which is a former steel manufacturing site on the Monongahela River. This is one of the first parcels that's being developed within a 178 acre development called Hazelwood Green. And as you can see, the building is huge. Uh, it's five football fields can fit inside of it. The site has a long history. It was originally purchased in 1758 uh, from the local indigenous tribes through the Stanwix Treaty. JNL Steel operated the site from 1884 to 1974, and at its peak, it had about 12,000 workers in the mill and surrounding buildings producing steel for the entire country. By the 1920s, Pittsburgh had produced a third of the nation's output of steel, or was producing a third of that production. And at some point during the project, we realized that 10 by 10's former office building in the North Loop of Minneapolis was built with JNL steel beams. And to learn that we were working every day in a building built from the products of the mill was really powerful. During World War II, Pittsburgh was producing so much steel that the hot metal bridge, which is the bridge in the north part, top part of these images, was the second most heavily guarded piece of infrastructure in the US. The steel industry started going through decline after the 1960s, and by 1998, the plants were closed and operations on the site were quiet. In 2002, four Southwestern Pennsylvania foundations in partnership with RIDC, who was our client, the nonprofit developer based in Pittsburgh, purchased the site for $10 million. From 2002 to 2015, RIDC managed and oversaw a ton of environmental remediation across the site. And also in parallel during that time uh, were dozens of studies and plans to create a world-class sustainable innovation district. Our incredible team of collaborators, which was led by MSR Architects here in Minneapolis, was selected in 2015. This project was also an opportunity for 10 by 10 to work with one of my personal professional idols and mentors, Julie Bardman from Dirt Studio. After all the remediation that had happened on the site before we became involved in the project, there were very few traces of history left on the site. There was a very robust post-industrial disturbance adapted ecology that had taken hold. Immediately, we acknowledged as a team that the risk in designing for a site like this is to be overly nostalgic or to obsess over the ruin itself and diminish its power through what we might do or add to it. And that ultimately we could compromise the story a site like this should be telling in its own right. We entered the project with a commitment to work with this tough site as we found it, to intentionally design with an economy of means and to celebrate working within the parameters of a low budget, to tell the story of scale, not just of the mill structure itself, but of economic contribution, of labor, material permanence that sites and buildings like this represent. It was important to respond to this industrial legacy by honoring that large scale and carefully integrating systems of resilience, like energy production, stormwater management, graywater reuse, and disturbance adapted vegetation into the bones of the project. There's also a dramatic disconnect between the site and the surrounding neighborhood, as you can see, and is often the case with river industrial sites like this. Railroad infrastructure, fences, expanses of overgrown brownfield terrain, steep fortified riverfront edges, all are layers of barriers that disconnect the community from the river over time. 
Several big ideas early on in the project and site realities drove the design approach. This idea of decoupling the new building with the existing structures, this diagram in the upper left, that these new autonomous buildings within the armature could be scaled up or scaled down as needed, shifted north and south to accommodate east-west crossings and passageways. Once the building was no longer kind of tied to that structure itself, the steel armature then became this critical landscape element helped us blur the relationship between inside and outside and allowed us to create this quarter mile long loggia or exterior porch and a series of public gathering spaces along it. The loggia is in this diagram highlighted here in yellow. Also the need for a very large stormwater facility to support a combination of storage, reuse and filtration quickly became a design driver. Here's the site plan as it stands more or less today. Phase one and phase two reached substantial completion this summer but we likely won't be able to go punch list it until next spring. I'm going to share with you today a project called the Sarasota Bay Park. And the big idea here is how you take a site from gray to green. The Sarasota Bay is an incredible space on the western coast of Florida that looks out across the Gulf Coast into the beautiful sunsets. It's a really dynamic natural environment with tropical vegetation and really beautiful climate. But our site was really underperforming, a 53 acre site, 75% of which was covered by asphalt. Um, it serves really a series of cultural institutions, including the Performing Arts Center here. But a group of citizens asked the question and created an organization to really ask the question, can this be more for the community? And they hired us to do a master plan. A team co-led uh, by Sasaki, uh, the Master Planning Prime, and my former firm, um, and ourselves at Agency as the design lead, and has grown and changed over time to be incredibly inclusive of lots of different technical experts and wonderful local teammates. Throughout our process of master planning and design, we've reached over 50,000 points of connection with this community through every different forum and community engagement process you can imagine. And through that process came to an idea of a total transformation of the site, creating a new site for a new future performing arts center that really capitalizes on the Bayfront site, transforming this site from the hard asphalt shell it is today to a much greener and bluer oasis for the community, really submerging parking underneath the landscape that reaches out and touches the bay, and a series of places that really um, create a sense of stewardship between the community and the bayfront. Wonderfully, when we finished the master plan, the client immediately wanted to show the community proof of concept, proof positive of all of their hard work, and asked us to take on a first phase um, design project we call phase one. It's a 10 to 12 acre community park on the southern edge of the master planning site. And as you can see, it includes features like the sunset boardwalk and a mangrove walk and a series of lawns and open spaces that really are we hope going to be a great community hub. Here you are looking back towards the sunset. You see the sculptural uh, sunset boardwalk, which really is like a clock. It allows you over the course of the year to experience that sunset, a mangrove and all of its unique kind of dark lushness against this incredible lawn um, and concessions building. And so while we imagined this park really as a place of gathering and as a community hub, uh, you know, this concession building and restrooms serve these spaces that are really infrastructure for public life. Um, we also see it as a place, importantly, to offer intimate nature-based experience. Places where you can experience the mangrove and the palm groves that exist and that sunset. Again, really building stewardship for a green and blue future for this community uh, and really pe putting people in touch with nature directly. So, Maura and David, so much of the work all three of us showed is about making and remaking previously known or made sites. And I'm just wondering in your big idea section, what kind of values do you think drove your decision making about what you keep and what you remove uh, in, a, in a site that's already known to a community? I think it's important to kind of acknowledge what, um, what we're bringing to the work, um, what biases um, and kind of intuition we might have the sort of instinctive, unavoidable, you know, intuitive sense. Um, and I think we try to actively um, embrace a process of working um, that removes that from, from our response. Um, so putting in motion um, 
a kind of a process that intends to undo or dislodge the intuitive response. Uh, and that's part of the experimentation or documentation um, that we deploy in order to see things differently or in unearth unexpected possibilities. So I think that it's just through that deep research and through a different kind of approach um, that we kind of come to the work um, in a way that's uh, more freeing and liberating and allows us to, you know, treat it with a more authentic kind of set of responses. Any given site has, you know, especially if you're dealing with the East Coast or you're, you know, Northern California, especially, I worked for 10 years, 12 years in LA, and you're kind of lucky if you had a Taco Bell on the site before, <laughs> you know, and so here you have layers of history that you can really choose what to pull out. I, I was talking to Maura before about George Dick Combe talking about landscape architects as being rag pickers or people who, especially in Europe, you know, looking at a trail in the Swiss Alps might have centuries of history, right? And so almost x-raying history and then thinking about what you want to pull forward and make literal or make more subtle or make episodic. Typically, uh, you know, some kind of collaboration with the past is, is really critical. Uh, and we look for that in projects. I'm going to throw a question um, out there. Um, so Gina, in, when you were talking about your um, big idea, um, I was inspired by the notion that the experience of a sunset kind of drive a design concept um, and wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about how kind of unseen um, aspects of a site maybe determine your approach to programming and design. Yeah, I thought that was a great question, Maura, that um, when we interviewed for the project for Sarasota, um, maybe you guys get asked this in interviews, I always cracks me up. Um, they said, you know, what's the wow element you'll bring to the project? And um, I talked about the rain, because the rainstorms in Florida, Florida afternoon in the summer, are like, unlike anything you could ever imagine, they're just like these downpours. I got caught the first time I went on site um, in this downpour, and I thought that is such a creative driver, right, this like downpour of rain. And the more time I spent on site, the more I realized that the sunsets were because you have the west coast of Florida, you're looking out over the Gulf, and you have this kind of steamy sky that turns all shades of colors, that that was really a bigger wow than anything we could do on land that we really had to just sort of make that mm -hmm. make that part of the you know celebrate that part of the experience by mm -hmm. making the spiral board rock rather than and it was a nod to the fact that of course the sun doesn't have a single direction in the sky it moves across the sunset moves across the horizon right with time and so um i love thinking about how do you do those subtle things that start to shift people's mindset and make them understand that the wow is kind of embedded all around them if they just take the time to sort of stop and see it. I think the sunset's the perfect example of that. Yeah. That design gesture was just a beautiful way and thinking and referencing it as a clock, I thought was a beautiful way to, to imagine or start to imagine how details or materials or just that kind of um, circumnavigation or being on an arc like that in that space was such a heavily exposed moment. I thought it was really beautiful. Thank you. And I think, you know, we, we talked about like interpreting that and, and ultimately decided to just not, not interpret it, to actually have like places to sit at different times of the year where the sunset would happen, but not describe that to people, just give them the place to experience it. And you would think that over years of going to a place, you might start to, you know, that, if that would become part of your experience. You would know that in the fall, it's over here and in the spring, mm -hmm. it's over here. And that would be a lovely discovery. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something, um, you know, that's really fascinating to me, you know, especially as designers thinking temporally. Mm -hmm. uh, the wow is an interesting thing. If we think about landscape architecture, it's, you could think about plan driven competitions that have been done in the past. They always had to have that icon or some kind of, whether it's a giant maple leaf floating in a bay or something that would grab the layperson's attention. Mm -hmm. um, and then you think about the, the more fine grained aspect of that you know, Mora, for example, you know, we should talk obviously about the beauty of entropy and the beauty of texture and history that's embedded in materiality and also the experience of seasons or that. And so I guess my question has to do with what we're designing for. You know, I am excited when you talk about that, Gina, because we talk about also designing for the 50th visit, not for the first visit. Mm -hmm. The first visit experience, it's almost like curating where you're going to see an art piece in a museum 
you have the information, you have the title of the piece, you have the year, you have the provenance, and then you have more detail and finer grain. And if you really want to spend the time, you get into it. And so we think about that jogger or that person walking home from work through this space, you know, and the 50th time they go, if they'll string things together or, you know, if there's a larger narrative that people can create for themselves. The design of South Park required both analog and digital research and work. The image that you're seeing here is kind of emblematic of that. You have on the left collaborative process of working through the design of a playground using a pin board and wires, and on the right, the inclusion of it in Rhino Grasshopper and its construction documentation. Everything really begins with the shape of the park itself. So the park, it's shaped basically like a skateboard, elongated kind of oval. We knew then that the pathway system itself had to be retained and have to move through it. The image you see on the left is the very first sketch that was done. And then you're starting to see its refinement, analog refinement, and then finally pulling that into Illustrator CAD and then over to Rhino Grasshopper, where details can be worked out and we can work through the design and detailing of many different facets of the project, from the playground to the tablet and paver system, even the signage and seat wall backing. A lot of the inspiration for the park came from experience in articulating bird skeletons as a job. So I worked as a taxidermist for Norm Hoke, you see here a zoologist and field biologist uh, working in the science department of university, um, doing study skins, taxidermy and articulating skeletons. And so with that knowledge, when you look at the project, you begin to see vertebrae and you begin to see scapula and rib bones and those kinds of things. So articulating the design of the park in the same way that you might put together a bird skeleton is very fitting being Halloween in a couple of days, but helped to guide me and guide us in the design of the project. This focus is on the playground, which we'll see a little bit in detail later. But the pin board that I mentioned on the lower left is a tool that allowed us to manipulate many, many different manifestations of the playground, different routings of wire, photograph them, kind of evaluate them and 3D scan them that eventually led to a commitment to a certain type of universal playground, something that had amenities for all ages embedded in it, but also was tied to its ground plane. Rhino Grasshopper allowed us to manipulate that perimeter and to also automatically populate it with netting and different amenities helped us to then finally commit to the final form. Also, it was used to do a little bit larger scale design research, which I wrote about in Brad Cantrell's Codify, if you're interested in following up and learning more about the process, its potential larger scale applications. For defining the palette for this project, we began with an extensive process aimed at inventorying the grit, the tactile qualities, the material physical scale of the place through various photography methods, rubbings, and clay impressions. Through these studies, we became very interested in the idea of collective memory, the relationships people build with places over time, and the role of those tactile sensory details to spark memory, to recall the past, and to strengthen our connection to our physical environment. There are lots of gems across the site as well, different materials and objects that we wanted to salvage and reuse. We spent a lot of time learning from and documenting the building itself, along with the architects, exploring access and movement of materials and processes within that building in the past were evident still in the remnant structures. How these stair landings you can see in the image on the right and catwalks through the structure provided these amazing means of seeing and surveying the building and the site together. So we slowly began to make our case to keep rather than remove almost everything. The material palette was grounded by steel and concrete. We created demolition plans and elevations that documented, quantified, and determined what elements of the existing building and site were to be either removed from the site or salvaged and reused. Even though we carefully specified and organized the demo and salvage plans by type, like the previous diagram. The contractor did not always stockpile those types as specified, and more than once did we find ourselves scrambling through these unorganized piles of steel 
to locate specific pieces and confirm the quantities. So this methodical and cyclical process of inventorying, documenting, re-inventorying uh, began. In a lot of cases, unfortunately, the contractor lost or misplaced or sometimes damaged pieces that were key elements of custom design features. Um, so that process of documenting more carefully and organizing lengths and quantities of what we had in those piles more carefully was really critical. We have a really well-documented salvage pile that we can now use in a more expedited way in, in phase three. Also because our palette is so limited, really with concrete and steel, it allowed us to really stretch and expand how we might use a simple set of materials. The concrete slab was cut into different sized uh, slabs and planks before being completely removed and crushed into a variety of sizes, also for different surface applications. And then stacking those by size and by type and inventory and quantifying them uh, so that we know how much we can use in phase one, two, and three throughout the life of the project. The next step for cleaning and cutting those, custom cutting those and uh, starting to fabricate those was quite easy. Well, you can see the quality of that kind of older steel uh, in some of these images and how that kind of tactile history is embedded in their surfaces. Because a lot of these pieces are taken from the site and are being kind of redeployed back into the site, there's a lot of field verification and on-site fabrication that had to take place. And so that was actually, I think, a way that the contractor became really familiar with a way of working that was quite different, using a simple set of design guidelines and customizing things a little bit more freely in place. So how do you define a material palette for a natural heritage that's rich and has that beachy, sunsetty, mangrovey vibe. That was the question we asked ourselves during phase one design as we thought about this first phase community park. But honestly, it was something we were asking ourselves the whole time we were traveling to Sarasota. Sarasota has a legacy of exceptional architecture. The Sarasota modern movement was here. It also has a built environment that really speaks to the natural heritage of the place and the unique hot, humid climate and coastal climate as you see through all of the shell. So throughout the time we went to Sarasota, we documented what we saw, what felt of the place, what weathered well within this climate and what gave that unique vibe. We tried to then translate this into a material palette, which will be used across all 53 acres and in this first phase of construction. That includes uh, hardwoods, precast, that's not entirely smooth, uh, shell concrete, which we've been working really hard to master, uh, netting, which is referential of the coast, and rubber surfacing. As you can see here, our lineup of materials kind of all tie together, giving the project a unified identity. We're really lucky that we have a phase 1A. It's actually in construction while we're designing phase one park. We have a, a continuous walkway around the mangrove, which is in construction now. It links together a series of what we call learning decks. They're interpretive nodes that really take advantage of unique features within the landscape. The path is a really important first phase. It offers a recreational connection to the community. And we thought it was important both that it's expressive of that shelly environment you see in the upper right, the oolite wall, which is like a local sandstone, the shell, shell concrete. And then this rubber surfacing, which they're laying down in the image here, is really about providing a soft surface, a recreational surface for the older population that we know will be using this path. And that's a big part of Sarasota's population. That path then connects together these interpretive nodes that we call the learning decks that each take advantage of a unique condition, whether this custom design seating experience at the Twin Oaks, a kind of gateway for the path as it moves uh, through the site, or this uh, swing deck that has a swing associated with a big bat like a sculptural bough of a live oak tree next to the mangrove, or the cabbage palm sitting space, which is really in this sharp um, arc of the path through this um, incredible cabbage palm grove, or a series of, of wetland decks that really are bridges uh, in the landscape that uh, connect over stormwater gardens that we've created. You can see interpreted there are the wetland grasses. And then lastly, the, the detail I'll talk about in the third chapter, this nest, which was inspired by our terminal location where there's an existing osprey nest, and we wanted to honor it by creating a nest for people. 
so I was curious how or if there there was sort of a feedback loop somehow between the sort of scientific, like your embedded knowledge in the science of bird bones um, and grasshopper and how maybe the the relationship between that inspiration and the technology at your fingertips worked together, if at all. As a designer, you know, you, it's not so much that you're designing something and saying, oh, it doesn't look enough like a bird bone. Let's keep working yep. on it. Let's put it into this program so it looks more like a bird bone. It's more as though you're designing something, you're like, what did I just do? You know, and then you think back, oh, that's right. Oh, bird and it. And then you start to, you know, it's more of a part of you. Hand drawing has limitations, you know, it just does. Yeah. And then obviously the tools, the most immediate tools that we have have limitations. And there's times where you are designing something that's purely formal, it's purely emotional. It's just like, draw it and it's just not right. And draw it, it's not right. Draw it, okay, let's put it into Grasshopper and let's make this line that looks like it a little bit and this line that's not it, but close. And then let's array those and then let's choose that, ah, that's the one. Yeah, I mean, looking at your kind of iterate on the black on the black slide, that iterative diagram of kind of pushing and pulling and how you can just adjust subtle inputs in Grasshopper to get that to um, sort of have your 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 strategy adapt. Um, I just thought the relationship between that process and what you were looking at as like a series of structurally connected pieces uh, mm -hmm. that flex based on input or, you know, be it wind or velocity. I just thought it was a really beautiful uh, relationship between the two processes. Um, I love it. Yeah. I mean, that, and I'll just quickly talk about that because that was more of a research agenda that had to do yeah. with being in Acadia and having it be like, what are we going to do? So we tried to recreate the South Park design process, which has to do with taking a straight line, connecting it to points, avoiding trees, creating a uh, tectonic, you know, in terms of the, the language and typology of the paving, and then offsetting that from trees, blah, blah, blah. So those are simple parameters that we could plug in. And we could plug in the tractors that could bend that line in different directions. And the reason why I'm going into the detail about this just now is because um, we felt as though that had an application for linear design systems like an LA river. So something that you, it wouldn't solve all problems, but you could put in clear parameters and apply it to a master plan scale to then zoom in and get suggestions or solutions that are based on real world uh, maintenance regimes, spacing, blah, blah, blah. And so that, that's, that's where I thought the research could go. Mm -hmm. I had this I had this revelation when I was watching your video, Maura, that, um, and this is a very old school question to ask you, but um, you don't get paid for that time, right? I mean, it's sort of like the community engagement work we do. Yeah. You, you could never recoup every hour of time you spend uh, doing that work. You know, it's kind of comes out of another place of that's, that's the creative inputs you need to do something successful in a place. So how does your yeah. firm, you know, did you talk about that? The fact that your process is is labor intensive, it's mm -hmm. uh, intensive over time. Yeah, no, that's a fabulous question. And anybody who has the answers on that can, you know, <laughs> I'd certainly love to hear them. I, I think we can get by with it by actually not doing a lot of due diligence and tracking it. Um, but mm -hmm. I think trying to fold it into, if somebody's out there inventorying bench types and amenities that are there and observing program, you know, we can also be deploying some of these more creative interpretations. Um, or explorations in, in that site. This particular project, we're also doing an exhibition around. So we are getting a little bit of extra um, support maybe from other collaborators to do this work. Uh, and it's also just embedding and thinking about the kind of critical side of the process. We do an excuse to do that. Um, and so that we can understand how, how to start getting clients to pay for it eventually. You know, what value did it bring? Um, how does this work in kind of a gallery setting uh, change change the way we might commit to it in in the field? And so the park itself had this wonderful, long, extended kind of oval space, and we didn't want to clutter it because it's not a huge park. And so what that meant was that the things that went in it and the things that we designed had to be curvilinear, had to respect and relate to that shape. Even the shape of the paving itself had to almost be a small version of the park itself. The shape of the curve had to be vaulted around the entire park. 
as well, the material palette had to unify the park. So everything is natural metal, aluminum, stainless steel, or natural concrete, or natural wood that's unfinished. So we tried not to use paint at all. That way, in a sense, you had both a formal unification of the park, continuous experience, and also a unification of the materials. These images are of the construction. We actually had a mobile batch plant that would make concrete right next to the park. It was really high quality. So it's being boomed into these forms that you're seeing. Nothing is ever as beautiful in its finished product as it is at any time during its construction. And these images are kind of proof of that to me. Here you see the forms have been taken off and the walls are starting to form the spaces. So the three details that I wanted to talk about a little are the play structure itself, the David Bowie bench and the paving system. So the play structure we talked about a little bit earlier, but it was meant to be a universal playground, something that adults could have meetings on or do exercise on or kids could play within. And uh, it was also integrated with its ground plane. So the images you see on the right are the steel structure itself. The ground plane kind of comes up to meet it. It's also inspired by roller coasters. These are images of Berliner factory in Germany, and they're very, very good at bending very thick walled steel pipes. We wanted it to look like a drawing. We wanted the steel diameter to be really small. So we could get eight inches um, from Berliner in Germany, whereas stateside, it would have had to have been closer to 10. And that was very important. And so you see the resulting playground with the undulating play structure and also the under undulating ground plane that is coming up to meet it uh, within the finished area. The next is a bench that uh, we were laying out and designing when David Bowie passed away. And so to celebrate him, we created this lightning bolt bench, very subtle celebration of him, sort of a memorial, and worked very hard on the detailing and the undulation of this mounted backing that also needed to serve um, as a safety barrier for, for children. And so you can here you can see it has a bit of an independent kind of incline and undulation that happens with the topography and with the sloping bench. And last, I want to talk about the paving system itself. We wanted something that would be relatively inexpensive. This is a low bid project. And so needed to use pretty simple materials and simple systems and wanted to achieve something that felt as though it were pavers or felt as though it were brought in and also to minimize jointing. And so we settled on this system of what we were calling tablets and sliders. This is the formwork. You'll see very simple 30 inch inside diameter drainage pipe is cut two by fours. And then you can see kind of eccentric rebar system. Here you can see the pores. So we wanted something to be poured monolithic, but look as though it was brought in or look as though they, these monolithic slabs were actually um, placed there. And so the system we thought was pretty clever. This is a mock-up that they're pouring, but they pour that entire space and then they use a double V-notch trowel and they trowel a line, two lines down. And then they go back in and they use what's called top cast. And what that does is it retards the surface that they can then spray off and get a really beautiful alternation of texture through the space. The other thing we wanted is, again, to kind of simplify all of the moves and unify everything was that the sliders themselves that you're seeing, which vary in length, would also become a header, would also become a curb, would also become a trench drain, would also become a slot drain. And so they did many, many different things throughout the park so that we could then integrate everything within one design move that related to the bigger picture of the shape of the park. the dynamic process of documenting, salvaging, and documenting again, all of these existing materials come together into the details. Well, concrete was typically used uh, for new slabs, planks, and rubble surfaces. Steel beams and C channels were integrated into furniture and railings. You could see on this diagram here how each of these different uh, existing elements was deployed into the details and around different areas of the project. We aim to be precise and elegant, but never precious. Uh, Julie Bargman's voice continues to echo uh, in my head for this project, saying, no sissy landscapes, build it like a blank. I'll let you fill in the blank. We used combinations of materials in different ways, 
to create variation and allow for unexpected and flexible uses, but we never strayed from our core material palette. What is built in the end is less about the design detail and instead what persists is the story of the materials themselves coming together in many different ways. Through these details, we bear witness to cycles of entropy and the tension between human-made materials and time. The act of designing with these elements felt often like the act of collaging or in a way creating living experiments. We tested combinations of elements together, picking from what was stockpiled, learning from and evolving the original set of details in a fluid way. As the rubble slope moves north, it becomes more wild and woolly, allowing for tactile variation without losing the legibility of the larger move. The quarter mile long stormwater system is broken into different sections and connected to different catchment zones so that the system can expand and evolve over time. The loggia is a 12 foot wide walkway sandwiched between the water channel on the left, in the case of these images, and the building on the right. The loggia and the water channel fit together like a zipper with porch-like zones sort of pushing into the channel and creating small gathering areas slightly above the channel itself and sloped or terraced basin edges pushing into the loggia, allowing the water to flood the column foundations and break the rigid line between the two spaces. You can see here the, the concrete slabs form a variety of edge conditions along the loggia edge. They're raw perhaps in, on their own, but installed with careful and precise intention, they become quite beautiful and elegant. All the furniture in the project integrates salvaged steel sections. In the case of the benches here, those base steel sections hold the wood off of the ground. Anytime we're integrating new materials, wood or steel in the project, it was using big, large scale pieces and simple detail assemblies. Similarly here, these steel foundation for the benches were salvaged um, and the large dug fir timbers are bolted together in a very simple way. In phase two, the loggia as we know it in phase one disappears. The ground is depressed here where a rail spur once entered the building and an elevated walkway allows pedestrians to continue moving through that zone between the armature and the buildings itself. And you can see on the ground plane, um, again, that kind of recycled concrete slab used in more of the plank form. The project celebrates the robust integrity of steel and concrete of the industrial legacy of this particular site and the innovative spirit that propels Pittsburgh forward into the future. So we've talked about the master plan at the Bay, and we've talked about how you make a palette that feels appropriate and specific to place. Now we're gonna talk about how we land all of that in one specific detail, part of the project we call the nest. And in order to do this, I've asked some of the designers on the team who've really had a hand in shaping it to tell you a little bit about their role in making this happen. Starting with C. We started with the idea of a simple resting space and decided that it should sit comfortably within the mangrove with a long view back towards the lawn. Inspired by the offspring nest nearby, we began moving towards an integrated structure that offers more ways for people to engage than sitting. It is a nest for people. Our nest became a gently reclining netting surface as the back of a wood bench where people can lay down and kids can climb around. Says. As for metal in a marine environment, 316 stainless steel, of course, is what we assumed. As landscape architects practicing for decades in New England, everything we thought we knew about metalwork on the coast was turned upside down when our clients, our architect, and our CM told us, practically in unison, 316 stainless will never last on the bay. Aluminum was the only way to go. Suddenly, stanchion sizes we assumed, based on stainless, were not structurally sound, and everything grew. Tatiana? We evaluated a number of decking options, looking for a sustainable material that's durable in this hot, humid, coastal environment. We rated its hardness, stability, ability to stay cool, its maintenance level, beauty and affordability, and our winner was Kebony Clear, a modified softwood. It's got a consistent grain and very few knots. It starts out this rich chocolate brown, but fades naturally to silver. It's super stable and will stay relatively cool in full sun. And since our selection, we've been testing samples of it, setting them out in the sun to weather. Netta? 
Inspired by the site's lush vegetation, I designed etchings in the decking that showcase the distinctive leaves of the mangrove and buttonwood trees that surround the nest. Abstracted and simplified, the leaf etchings are routed into the deck boards and infilled with dark transparent stain for contrast and longevity. The etchings are paired with interpretive texts, including the botanical and common plant names. Matthew? An interactive and high-touch experience, the nest is designed like a well-crafted piece of furniture with integrated and deliberate material interfaces, clean and concealed structural and attachment mechanisms, and a cohesive scoring and jointing rhythm. The detailing and design was iterative and collaborative, extending beyond the construction documentation. We worked closely with our construction team, Swift, who grounded our detailing with regionally specific precedents and our material experts, Mullets, who are skillful masters in aluminum fabrication. So you can see how so many different minds and so many different experts came together to make this incredible piece of urban furniture, which we're excited to open on the Bayfront in June of 2021. I'm gonna ask David, one of the things that I thought was really, yeah, that you, you talk a lot about the project being low bid, which, you know, most, most public work is. Which about is also being what? Low bid, yeah. Bid, um, yeah. the relationship between yourself and the and the design vision and the fabrication process is super fascinating to me. Especially like you know this idea that the idea of the pavers, which I thought was so beautiful. You know, you wanted to make something that was unique and custom to the place and referential of the place, but you don't have the money to do something that's super. I think you said imported. Yeah. Word. <laughs> so how do you how do you how do you not import something that looks imported? It was a really beautiful idea. Um, I think though what I meant and what I, I love all meanings of the word imported in this context, but I think what I meant was something that's giant and like monolithic in place. So to trick the lay person, and we try to do that on a lot of, on all of our public projects to find clever ways, you know, whether it's even just new surfacing methodology or something that to see something from a lay person's perspective and to see something from our perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, of course, we love all the stuff we love, but very little of that filters to those people, you know, not those people, but, you know, to the, uh, to the, 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 to the jogger and mm -hmm. who knows who. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think that in that case, it was, it, it actually, I didn't talk about the construction methodology very much or the construction documentation where we created a documentation set that was more of an Ikea type mm -hmm. set. It showed the assembly. I didn't talk about it in the presentation, but we are, what we're saying is we're creating a set the low bid cost estimator will look at and understand. Yeah. So if that low bid cost estimator looks at this crazy, you know, dragon's back thing with all of these pieces of wood, then um, he'll be like, yeah, it's $350,000 you know, and go home early. But if we create that set, we show how it's assembled three-dimensionally, we quantify it for him, and we literally take a board of Kebony, say this is a Kebony two by four, and we show where you can mill four of these things from one board, then he's like, oh, cool, counts them up. Oh, then we need to get 85 boards. And so that um, approach helps with low bid projects. You have to put together the sets as if they're IKEA sets and speak to that person that's reading the drawings, not create that much work for them. Yeah, I could, <clears throat> I could see that even just how intelligent it was, the replication of the form and the replication of the molds, right, or the, the, the form work so that you could imagine it being efficient and making it, even though it looks incredibly custom and, and, and uh, unique. Yeah. Yeah. Very smart. With the nest and the inspiration of the osprey, um, and the kind of crazy wacky nests that they tend to make. Um, I was just curious how you, I mean, that same question of sort of what the public's expectations are or our clients' expectations around refinement and durability of materials, um, how for the nest in particular, you guys are kind of balancing or negotiating um, the inspiration and the realization. Yeah, it's a great question. We, we, 
we, um, we have this really strange construction process. It's, I'm used to the low bid process, <laughs> even though it's been like my whole career. Sarasota, is a, we have a construction manager who has been on since, since schematic design, really. And so it's a very different and very, um, and we're navigating a really complicated process of, you know, we gave the nests along with all the other learning deck drawings at a very early level. And then we've been working through the construction while they've been sort of beginning the construction of the path of those of those items, right? So we've been doing the research collaboratively with them around the wood species. We, we've we been working hand in hand with the aluminum fabricator who's doing all the metal work. Um, we did all the pricing of all of the different components and we struggle a little bit because I don't think the I don't think the contractor knew um, when he got involved. I was like, we would normally build this thing in full scale. We would draw every detail of it. The idea of like collaborating on the construction detailing was just so foreign to me, and I was so nervous that it would be a hard battle. You know, yeah. that we would be fighting for things. It's been quite the opposite. They've been really on board, and and really, it's been fascinating because sometimes like we're really struggling at this moment with the intersection of where the metal fascia, which wraps the backside mm -hmm. of the nest, meets with this uh, netting material and the different forms that are possible with metal worked aluminum versus what's possible with the netting and the structural system to make it safe for people in their bodies, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. but it's been this, we've been drawing probably like once a week, we have a session where we draw through that detail, <laughs> that corner detail with the contractor. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's flummoxed all of us. Like we, we come back, we'll be like, hey, I had this other idea. Like what if instead we did a wood top and it curved over and it did this other thing. So, so it's, been a, it's been an unusual process for me, or I guess is the long answer to that yeah. question. I think we, we, knew, we knew kind of the basics of the form we wanted to give it that was related to its site. We knew the kinds of um, elements that it would make up. We wanted it to be a seat. We wanted it to feel a little bit like a classroom. We wanted it to orient your body so you, in the nest you would see the osprey nest um, mm -hmm. and then from there it's all been just trying to determine what's going to be most durable in that climate what will be comfortable for people and what can we actually build with the materials we're, we're mm -hmm. talking about so